All right. I think we're live. Hey, Dr. Ernie. Hey, Becky. It's a holiday. It is. Well, it's not a holiday. It's a, an awareness day. It's National Pet Obesity Awareness Day. I've been seeing all these people say National Pet Obesity Day. Guys, in 2005, when we started this, it's National Pet Obesity Awareness Day. We really don't celebrate obesity. We do want to raise awareness. That's a good point. I think I misquoted it as well. Well, we're oh. going to give a few minutes for folks to get um, logged in here to get tuned in. And I know there is a lot of excitement around today. Uh, a lot of folks got to attend Dr. Ernie's session on Sunday, right? It was Sunday at the um, Pet Behavior Summit. And the it drummed up the excitement for today. I know that. So um, before we jump in, I want to give you a proper introduction. Um, I know I'm really excited to have you here today. Most of you folks know me. Most of you know um, Cat Coach Becky. Tell me where you guys are um, from, what you're doing this afternoon. Dr. Ernie and I are actually both from North Carolina. I think most of you guys know where I am. He's not too far from me. So um, I I'd normally ask how it is there, but i I guess it's just like it is here. <laughs> it is. It is. It's a beautiful sunny day. Little beautiful. north wind. Uh, high today was 80. Uh, so it, it was really nice. So if you could get outside today, I hope you did. I uh, hope you got in your workout, one or two of them. So speaking of workouts, right? <laughs> well, hopefully you're out walking your cat. I don't know, getting your cat some out and about and some mental stimulation. But really and truly, we are here for um, actually for a really fun Q&A. We are here mostly to field your questions. So start pouring them into the comments section. And, you guys and one, let us one quick know. note, uh, one quick note, Becky, for the questions, because I'm already seeing some roll in. We are, are unable to name specific brands. Uh, we can't give you a specific diet recommendation. Uh, and we'll talk more about why that is. Uh, the brand thing is, is more of a, you know, we, we can't be seen as condoning, endorsing, or sponsored by, I mean, because we're not. So we can't give you specific name brands, but there are some special tenets around therapeutic formulations. And we can talk about sort of what a, a therapeutic diet looks like and, and what certain nutrient profiles look like. Uh, but we, we can't go specific, like your cat should be fed ABC wet food or whatever. Although yeah. I will definitely, I'd love to talk about dry versus wet when it comes to weight loss in cats. That's something to to keep going out there. If you're interested in it, let me know. Yeah, we'll dog ear that. Before we dive in too much, I want to give you a proper introduction. Um, I think most everyone knows the amazing Dr. Ernie, but if they don't, I really do want everybody to get a chance to, to know your accolades because um, truly you are um, pretty celebrated in the veterinary industry. You've been along a uh, I don't want to say around a long time in an insulting way. <laughs> you have uh, uh, like a fine wine friend. So um, Dr. Ernie Ward is the the founder, the voice behind Pet Obesity, the Association of Pet Obesity Awareness, uh, the Association of Pet Obesity Prevention, which created today, which is the Awareness Day. Um, so one of the one of the first things I want to ask you, Dr. Ernie, is like, where did this passion come from for you? We're going to dive into everybody's questions, but just give us a little background on you and his, and how you ended up here with this passion and being really one of the leading experts. Yeah, that's a, that's a great start. And hopefully, uh, can you hear me okay? Is my audio okay? I just want to make sure. We hear you that, great. Okay, perfect. Uh, you never know with live streams and the internet these days. Uh, it's awful. My passion for obesity really originated in my passion for longevity. So um, really at an early age, and by I say early age, early adulthood, uh, during undergrad, you know, I became kind of just not obsessed, but really, really captivated by the physiology of longevity. And this was just an emerging science at the time. So if you kind of dial back to the 80s, 1980s, you know, a lot of uh, really, you know, sort of fu fundamental research was being conducted. And, you know, things like rapamycin were really, you know, coming to the forefront of, of longevity. And we were understanding the telomere relationship to life expectancy or lifespan in many species, especially uh, some cestodes or, or types of worms. And so, um, you know, as a young student, this was something that, wow, I found really interesting. And so um, what happens is if you study longevity, you immediately back into nutrition because that is kind of the foundation for most of 
how we age, right? So what we eat, the exposure to different toxins, the systemic inflammation, the glycemic swings, you know, so the blood insulin and blood sugar swings that we take in, uh, you know, all those things sort of come to nutrition. And that's really, you know, I would say that that obesity is really just, inter it's just an extension or a progression of my desire to help dogs and cats live longer. Um, you know, in 2015, uh, I actually started something called Project 25. And when I first started that, I, I was actually giving a keynote at a nutrition conference in Barcelona. It was a beautiful, beautiful conference. And so it was the wrapping up of the conference. It was the last day or the the last full day and there was like a half day the next day. And so I gave that that late afternoon keynote and I sort of laid out my plan. I said, why? I said, you know, here we are amongst some of the foremost nutritionists in the world. And I said, why are we afraid to say, why don't dogs or ask the question, why don't dogs live to be 25? Why does it seem preposterous to say, why doesn't my cat live to be 25? And I outlined what I was cooking up with Project 25. And it was really, Becky, like an atom bomb. It split the room, right? So there were half of the, the people in attendance were like, this is exactly the right question we should be asking. Why aren't we asking, you know, how long our dogs should live and what, what can we do to extend that life expectancy? And the other half of the room was just like, that's nonsense. You know, I mean, why are you asking this question? It's a stupid question. And, and so I've found that, that nutrition, obesity, longevity, they're all interlinked, but yet you do find that it's polarizing to people. And so, you know, and I think we'll find out today, there's definitely, you know, some, as I mentioned in all my talks, if you want to start a fight these days, ask somebody, well, you can ask them today who they're voting for, or what do you feed your pet? Yeah, it, it's so true. And it's one of the, the biggest concerns, questions, comments we get from our our um, clients over at Base Paws that are in Coach My Cat that just want to make sure they're doing the right thing. And I think people know that nutrition is a basis of health. And so a lot of our questions that we're getting from everybody is more maybe nutrition related than obesity related. So you can try to tie them in for us together. Um, you've already caveated we won't endorse certain brands, but let's take that first question and, and, and talk about ingredients. So maybe we can rephrase this as how do we evaluate wet foods to know that we're feeding a, a food that's good for our cat? Okay, so let me first back up. I think this is a great segue into should you feed? Okay, now let's let's back up one more step. And let's say your cat does need to lose weight. Because if you have a domestic short hair, domestic medium hair, domestic long hair, it should weigh 10 to 11 pounds. Now it is true. Some of my colleagues, we have sort of made this a little extension, you know, it's crept forward and we'll say 10 to 12 pounds. But when we look at the actual anatomical measurements, which we have done at the association uh, for, you know, thousands and thousands of cats over the years, we know that that actual ideal weight is around 10 to 11 pounds, but whatever, I'll give you 12. I, I'm not going to argue that point today, but let's say you've got a 14 pound cat today, which many of you do. Let's say you have a 15 or 16 pound cat, which sadly many of you do, and, and you need to lose a little bit of weight. So that cat needs a little bit of help. So this is where I first start to say, okay, how can we measure precisely the number of calories that your cat is getting? And so in 2006, we conducted a very simple study, okay? And we did this for small dogs and cats. And we took the top 10 at the time, top 10 dry kibble cat foods. And you guys can imagine some of the brands are still the most popular cat foods today. And we said, what would happen if a cat owner accidentally, inadvertently, fed an extra 10 little kibbles a day. Okay, so the tiny little kibbles of the cat food, what if you accidentally put 10 extra than they needed in the bowl each day? What would that do over a year? And on average, that's a little over a pound of weight gain per year, Becky. So you can wow. see the precision in, in actually doling out that food is really important. And so this is what led me back in 2006 to start writing papers and say, okay, look, at least I can contain the number of calories if they're giving some kind of canned food. So whenever people ask me, what should I feed my cat who needs to lose a little weight or to try to even maintain a healthy weight, I usually start backing into canned diets, especially for weight loss, simply because we can control the calorie portions more accurately has nothing to do with the formulations. I mean, in a few instances, perhaps, but in general, it's going to be more about calorie or, or portion control. And so um, I, I think that's a good starting point. Now, it is true. If you want to maintain a healthy body condition, and this applies to dogs, cats, people, or if you want to shed a few un unnecessary pounds, calories rule. 
no doubt about it. However, there's a little caveat, a coda to that. While calories rule, formulation determines health and safety. And this is really important in cats. So now you've got a 14 or 15 pound cat and you're saying, well, I'm just going to feed it less. And this is where calories rule, right? You will lose, your cat will lose weight, but it will not be safe or healthy because you didn't get the formulation right. You wound up restricting and removing essential nutrients, essential fats, essential proteins, essential vitamins and minerals and so forth. And for cats, remember, Becky, as you know all too well, we've seen this in the ER so many times, these people that crash, they, they just say, I'm, I'm not feeding my fat cat anymore, you know, cutting the food in half. They get into, they go into liver failure within 72 hours. It's called hepatic lipidosis. Sometimes we can reverse it back in the ER. Sometimes we can. I mean, you and I know when we see those yellow ictric cats pop in, we're just like, oh my, and they're obese. That yeah. really breaks our heart. So again, when I look now um, at the calories rule, but formulation determines safety and, and, and health, I go, okay, what do cats need? Well, we know their physiology is different than dogs and people. And we know that, that they have a different energy system. They use a form of sugar called glycogen for their primary energy source, as opposed to fatty acids, which dogs and humans use, which quite frankly is the reason that we are able to do persistence hunting. So we originated actually traveling great distances. We, we actually could control our body temperature better than the prey that we were seeking. So we were able to outrun, outlast, you know, outthink and in, in the end, our prey, whereas cats have to be able to outrun. Okay. So that's the huge difference. So if you want to be able to sprint, you use a form of sugar, but you only get short burst 90 seconds. So that's a long winded way around the mulberry bush, so to speak, to say that when it comes to, to the diet, we know that we've got to get protein into those cats. Okay. That's really what they need physiologically, uh, metabolically to actually keep them. So I, I like to get those canned foods and I typically for weight loss diets in cats, we're definitely going to be north of 35%. I do prefer some of those cat therapeutic weight loss diets that are hitting upwards in the 40% range, you know, so 38, 42%, uh, higher protein diets for cats for sure. Now, caveat again, Becky, um, this is one of the areas that a canned therapeutic weight loss diet can give you a, an advantage because you can add more fats into that can than you can into the kibble. This is just a processing limitation. When you extrude food through a, a, these processes to make the baked kibble, the fats, of course, you know, evaporate, they oxidize, you can't use them, they aren't stable, like they are in a can. So we can actually get a higher fat, higher protein diet, which is kind of a secret sauce for, for many cats when it comes to therapeutic weight loss. Yeah, it's, it's so often a combination and there's no one right thing, right? So it's getting that balance and, and you make such a good point. Now, when you're talking about measurements and the accuracy, I, I see questions up here and I know the question is arising, what about raw diets? Yeah. And, and again, you know, we're not going to comment on specific, you know, I, as a veterinarian, I see too many problems with raw diets. Uh, quite frankly, most of the time, these cats uh, and dogs uh, have tremendous nutritional imbalances. And so it's very, very difficult to, to actually do a raw diet right. Uh, you know, I mean, a cat's natural diet is not, I mean, our, our domesticated cats, I think the word there is domesticated. We've changed them over tens of thousands of years. They have evolved now to actually thrive on a wide variety of energy sources, including carbohydrates, including plants. So, you know, it's, it's a very different, I mean, you can't compare my kitty cat, itty bitty kitty, who's just outside the door here and I can hear her banging. Uh, I can't compare her to a cheetah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, we've removed them through tens of thousands of years. So again, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not endorsement. I don't, believe in a raw diet. I think it poses severe risk uh, to the cat in the long run. I think that, you know, unless you do it really right under close supervision with a veterinary supervision with a veterinary professional, that you can you can really cause some serious problems. And of course there's some zoonotic issues, you know, with people, you know, contaminating their family with salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, you know, and so forth. Yeah, no, it makes a, a lot of sense. And it, the portion control to me the aspect of, you know, the difference of nutrient absorption that I think a lot of folks don't necessarily understand that that's why, you know, um, we want to be really careful because our pets don't absorb nutrients the same way we do. So, you know, that chicken breast to them is not the same as that chicken breast to you. And that's why those protein percentages matter so much, right? Because they actually are an entire profile of different types of nutrients that they, some cats are, are, 
need a wider variety of than others, right? Yeah. And, and, and this is the first thing too. you know, I, I get really frustrated, Becky, because people want the silver bullet when it comes to weight loss. And there's just a bunch of lead bullets that you have to keep firing over and over and over again, you know, and the problem is we exhaust our arsenal of tricks and then people just give up. But the really reality is there will, there's rarely a single diet that I can put a dog or cat on throughout their weight loss journey. And that that's the one that they end on, right? So typically we start and we go through a series of plateauing metabolic adaptations and then we wind up changing the formulation. And this means sometimes changing brands. I mean, changing everything. Uh, I will say, um, as I mentioned on Sunday, really the most heartbreaking thing for me are the, are the pet parents that come in and they've, they've had their cat on this expensive vet weight loss diet for a year and my cat's just gained another pound. Well, again, this is a bit of lunacy because, you know, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. This is why it is imperative. It is essential. If you hear nothing else that I say today, hear this. You need to be evaluating whatever it is that you are doing every 90 days and then changing as needed. So for most of my pet patients, especially cats, that first 90 days, and remember, we're looking at a maximum safe weight loss in most domestic cats uh, are, is going to be about a half a pound a month. That's really when you when you do the math, when you actually look at how these organs are affected and how you can get macro and micronutrients into these cats, it really equals about a half a pound a month. I mean, obviously there's some exceptions at both ends of the spectrum, very large cats, very small cats, but a half a pound a month. And so if you look at that in, in 90 days, if the cat hasn't lost a pound and a half, I'm going to reevaluate re -evaluate my um, approach. And what this will often mean is maybe I can reduce the calories a little more, or maybe I can change the formulation. And typically you run out of the, you, the calorie threshold hits pretty quickly because as I mentioned, calories rule, but we can't get into starvation and deprivation because then that leads to a whole host of nutritional imbalances and disease. Okay, so then this is going to tie in really well to this question that we have from the Cat Summit. If you don't recommend treats, what do you recommend to use for clicker training and positive reinforcements? Yeah, well, two different questions, right? I mean, so treats are training, okay? I mean, so so if you're training a pet, that's not a treat. If you're training, clicker training a cat, you're not giving them a treat. You're actually giving them a food lure to try to get a desired behavior or outcome. What we talk about as treats are sort of outside of all of that. A treat is just like it sounds. It's like reward. It's just giving yourself something. It is, there's no action. There's no consequence. There's no, no outcome, you know, there's no outcome or objective of it. So that's, I mean, when we really want to look at the, the definitions, treats are, are something that are, again, are just an, an, ex, an excess, something extraordinary. So if you want to use, you know, salmon flakes or whatever, have at it for training, that's one issue. But remember, if you're going to use those calories as a food lure to, entice a certain behavior or outcome, then you've got to then adjust their overall calories. And so this is why with cats, I mean, and, and even at the, the little summit, I mentioned that there were products out there that were trying to tempt you. And that is not in any way meant to help train your cat. So, and, and honestly, you know, Becky, I wish that more cat owners would try to do training with their cats and, and clicker train and so forth. But you and I know that is like a 0.01% maybe of all cat parents out there. I mean, it's, it's too small. So when we talk about treats for cats, we're talking about that stuff, just like you do when you dole it out for dogs, it's just an extra thing to make you feel good probably, or maybe back off the pestering, but it's in no way has a positive, you know, objective. That makes sense. You know, the difference between a grandma visit and an allowance, right? right. <laughs> and I that's helpful, an right? Because so, yeah. <laughs> it's helpful though, because we want to, now this makes me think about the next part of this, which is begging. So a lot of times we end up in these overfeeding situations because we feel like our pets are begging or they're starving or they think they're starving. How do you address that emotional factor with your clients? Right. Well, well, first of all, let's talk about why this happens in the first place. I mean, this is actually a, well, we could, if we did diagnose this in cats, we would diagnose this as a food addiction. And what happens typically when we overfeed, especially when we overfeed carbohydrates, which are, are changed into a variety of sugars, you wind up affecting the three major neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and serotonin. And so, I'm sorry, dopamine, dopamine and serotonin. And what happens then is the cat 
develops literally a dependency on getting that hit, that jolt. Uh, and it was really interesting because some of the early like um, opioid research that was done and methamphetamine research that was done and cocaine and things like that, they were done on lab animals. And what they quickly discovered was, wow, you know, we can actually mimic this by giving them sugar water. So it's it's quite frightening. But but that begging and pestering behavior typically has to do with neurochemical changes. Your cat literally has gotten addicted to a feeling uh, and, and they aren't feeling true satiety. And this, this is something that, that I do want to touch on a little bit. And this is where protein can be your best friend because we know that protein actually interacts with a wide variety of hormones uh, and even in the stomach uh, and the small intestine that actually tell the brain to shut down the hunger, okay? So it's it's a real simple response. And protein, you know, so when a cat in particular senses high protein meal, then that tells the brain, hey, I'm satisfied, I, I don't need to beg. And so one of my all time best and favorite treat, tricks for cats who have begging, you know, they wake you up at 3.30, 4 in the morning, they pounce you on the bed and they're like, hey, feed me, feed me because I'm addicted to food. One of the things we say is give them a midnight snack and this should be a high protein midnight snack. Now, again, you've got to count calories, right? Calories rule, but nutrients determine health and safety. So when I'm looking at that, that midnight snack, what I'm trying to do is trigger those hormonal responses to give you an extra hour of sleep. Okay. And, and, and not all cats respond to this, but I will tell you this, most cats will respond to this, especially if you do it consistently, because what I'm often do. And Becky, I feel like sometimes I'm like a, you know, a substance abuse counselor for these cats, because I think I'm trying to wean them off of these awful high carb, high calorie diets that they've been just allowed to graze all day, you know, which is again, is not really normal cat behavior. And so, you know, you're trying to say, we're going to go through withdrawal. And one of the symptoms of withdrawal is the begging. Yeah. Makes me feel like becoming an adult and coming off Wonder Bread. I mean, right? <laughs> like we were all raised on carbs. You know, Becky, I, feel I, it. I tell people, challenge yourself and you should probably do some periodic, you know, fasting away from sugars and things, simple sugars at least. Uh, and you will find that you have these intense cravings. Now that is linked that is really almost directly to dopamine. to dopamine. Uh, so, you know, there are really neurochemical foundations for why this is, but if you ever want to just, ch if you want to feel like your cat on a diet, so to speak, uh, you know, just try to say, I'm not going to have any sugar for the next couple of days or any simple sugars and see how you feel. You might be a little Who grumpy. do I go to to beg? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a couple of great questions here. You're talking about calories count. Okay. And so we know that calories have to be reduced for weight loss. I think one of the most important things to remember too, is to feed to the weight that you want your cat to be, not to the weight that they are, but talk a little bit about the percentages of calorie reductions. Yeah. How do you calculate it? How do you know? And how do you know what's safe? Right. Well, again, you know, if your cat is 14 pounds or more, they clearly have obesity. You really need to be talking to your veterinarian because you're not going to be able to achieve this safely on your own. I mean, you can't just cut the calories because as I mentioned before, once you start dropping down below 30% of the calories, which think about it. I mean, Becky, if you're feeding a cup a day, that's just dropping a third of a cup. And then you're in nutritional danger land. I mean, this cat could, could just have liver failure within 72 hours. So we've, you know, this is not, this is kind of a fine line. This is why I yeah. really want you to work with your vet. But yeah. uh, I will say in general terms, you can, we use something called resting energy requirements. And these are a bit of, uh, you know, I, when I first started talking about this, you know, 20 years ago, there really was no consensus around what the formula was. There were a lot of different formulas, a lot of different data points, a lot of different studies, and it's intensely hard to measure, you know, so what they would have to do is try to take uh, dogs and cats and put them in these hermetically sealed cages, right? So there's no, uh, the temperature is tightly controlled, humidity is tightly controlled and so forth. And then they would have to try to measure what they actually, their weight loss, right? So these energy expenditures are, are, are quite, you know, and, and complicated. And so that's why you had all these formulas. Well, you know, I, I wound up kind of going to this one formula of RER and I, and, and the reason that it, it, it appealed to me was because there was a lot of, I mean, this was one of the better research studies done back in the seventies. Uh, and it was like the one that I thought, wow, okay, this seems the most validated. And it has now, I mean, now when you look at that formula, that is the formula everybody uses. And, you know, there's two ways to look at it. There's one that uses an exponential factor, a 0.3 quarter, you know, three quarter to the three quarter power to the 
0.75 power. Uh, and that's the one we usually use in the clinic, Becky. But, you know, you can also calculate it. You just take 30 times your the body weight in kilograms plus 70. And that's the one that works for most people. It actually is pretty accurate for cats. For very, very small, tiny dogs and very giant breeds, it's not, not as uh, accurate, kind of like the BMI in humans. But getting back to this whole thing, your veterinarian is going to do a body condition score. And I can't stress that en enough. And, and there's a wide you know, variety of measurements and metrics that we'll use for that. Uh, often they'll even, especially when I have an obese, a cat with obesity, I wind up doing a muscle condition score because sometimes we're really worried about the underlying loss of muscle strength. I mean, a lot of these cats with obesity, Becky, I mean, they're not able to get in the litter box anymore. I mean, it's the atrophy. Is heartbreaking. But anyway, we will then calculate the number of calories. But remember, you know, you've got a very fine line of what you can reduce to, which is leading me back to this a half a pound a month for cats. See, I mean, you can't crash these cats. There, there were some early studies done in the 90s about really uh, under close supervision, if you could run IV nutrients into these cats. I mean, these are kind of bizarre experiments, but you know, could you crash diet them? And and even in the most highly supervised, you know, artificial environments of IV nutrients and oxygen supplementation, you know, these cats were on the threshold of developing hepatic lipidosis constantly, Becky. So I just tell people with cats, you really need to take it slow. You need to keep a close eye on it. And when you hit these plateaus, you change something every 90 days, you reevaluate and you adjust as needed. Yeah, it's like that, you know, the myth where cats up a tree and they'll say, oh, you never see a skeleton of a cat up a tree. I'm like, well, that's because it gets weak and falls out and dies before it's a skeleton. But like, no, you have to get that cat down. Like a, 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 they will starve to death. And I think people just think animals inherently won't. And they absolutely will. So, um, okay, you were talking about body condition score. And one of the questions that came up was, how can I tell if my cat is fat or fluffy? So there are some kitties who have these like intensely thick coats and they are really fluffy. So talk a little bit to that point. How can we tell? Right. And, and and people often misconstrue. So cats have a normal anatomical structure on their underside. It's a flap of loose skin that allows them to hyperextend their hips. So when they're actually running at full blast, this is why you see those beautiful cheetahs with their legs completely splayed out. So that that little, you know, sack that you see, that's not that wasn't caused by the vet spaying your cat. You know, it didn't have anything. It's not there's not a fat pouch in there. I, I had a lady one time say, is that where they they store their kittens? No, no. No, no, no. Oh, none of those things. It's a normal, it's, it's a normal anatomical structure. So that makes it difficult, right? What we're looking for is, is honestly, for me with cats, I mean, visually you can get a very good idea, you know, because morphologically they, they do tend to be rotund. The two ways to look. So if you just want to look at a cat and get a general idea, number one, you need to have the cat standing up on all fours and look at it from the side. And what you're really looking for, again, for getting that little pendul you know, little uh, flap of skin, you're looking for this pendulous abdomen. And where I, my eye goes to is just beneath the rib cage. So I go just back from, you know, here's the, the rib cage. And then I look right there at that inflection point. So in a normal cat, the rib cage should be here, a little indentation, and then a normal sloping of the, of the abdomen. And what you'll see is there it's ribs and it goes down, right? These are torpedoes. Okay. These are blimp cats. And so when I look at that, if there's no indentation up from the back of the ribs, then I already say, wow, we probably have, you know, we, what we would call, you know, abdominal adiposity or visceral adiposity, that fat that's around the, the organs in the, in the abdomen. The yeah, second thing that the you want to fat. Yeah, the, the worst type of fat. Absolutely. The other view that I look at is then with the cat standing from above and you should see an hourglass indentation and people are like, I've never seen that in a cat. It's like, that's because most of the cats you've seen are overweight or have obesity. But normally, again, that rib contour should come in the abdominal wall. And actually, you know, Becky, you and I work a lot with feral cats. I mean, we look a lot, we work with rescue cats and all those cats, if you look at them from above, I mean, they are like hourglass, you know, and actually when you palpate them, when you touch them and you feel the the abdominal muscle, the wall is so strong because it has to be because they are propelling themselves at great, you know, velocities. And so, um, you know, when you feel your cat tonight, you might not feel those rock hard abs. 
<laughs> you know, because they're they're just not getting the activity. But really looking at them from the side, if they don't, you know, if they have that big, you know, we used to call them Swiffer cats, but they have that pendulous abdomen. You look at them from the top, and they just look like a big torpedo or a blimp. Those are all easy indications that your your cat has is carrying too much weight. Yeah, and I mean, okay, I'm not gonna lie to you, Doctor Ernie. You know, we struggle a little in our house. I've got one boy cat who is spelt. I mean, he's a big boy anyway, and he definitely has, you know, his that pouch, but you can tell there's nothing in it. Right. It is getting a little saggier as he ages. Gravity is doing his job, but he's got a great body condition. Then I have a female cat who just struggles a little bit more. She's petite, but she's a little rounder. And so I, we, I wonder a little bit about genetics and sex. Can you speak to that point? Yeah. Do you notice it's easier for a boy cat or a girl cat to lose weight, and how much of this yeah. is genetic? Yeah, great point. Okay, so first and foremost, let's get the uh, the spaying and neutering out. When we remove the sex hormone uh, organs, we remove the sex hormones. So reproductively, that requires a lot of energy. In fact, honestly, we all of us that are living here on this planet, we are designed to do really one thing, Becky, and that is to procreate another thing that's a lot like us that's carrying the same DNA. You know, that's why they call us DNA farms. Okay, so not this girl. We remove that. We remove that. Okay. When you take the reproductive organs out, you instantly drop their immediate energy requirements by 20 to 30%. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because we all can imagine that the way, you know, cats uh, and, and humans and dogs, that we have ovulation. Now, obviously, you know, cats are induced ovulators, so they are very different than people which ovulate, you know, they menstruate at a set cycle, you know, uh, and, and dogs do something kind of in between those two. So the energy requirements for cats are different, but what we are now starting to understand is that for females that are spayed, as you would expect, the energy requirements are more. So therefore, if you spay or neuter them, those kitty cats suddenly, you know, when you feed them the normal amount of diet, boom, they blow up. And this is, you know, what led, um, you know, myself and then that led to some research done by my good friend, Dr. Alex German, uh, University of Liverpool, who works for Royal Canaan. You know, he did, um, we, we, I used to say, I used to joke and I said, man, man, I can tell you with almost certainty which dog or cat is going to develop obesity by the age of nine months. And, you know, if you start thinking about it physiologically, wow, that makes a lot of sense because skeletal maturity for most dogs and cats is around that time. And what I was looking at, I, I was just seeing these cats and dogs who were being overfed, Becky, and what else had happened maybe a couple of months prior to that nine month they were spayed or neutered. And so I yeah. knew that if the owner didn't adjust and adapt their feeding guidelines, that if they started, you know, the growth curve started doing this after spay or neuter around nine months of age, then, you know, it was almost going to be hopeless very quickly. Uh, because again, as we mentioned, you know, cats, you can only lose about a half a pound a month. So, you know, if you've got, if you have to lose three pounds already, you know, that is a six month uh, process minimum. And that's hard to maintain. So yeah. and getting back, you know, getting back to that, the second thing is genetics. And this is the thing that, you know, this is why I'm so happy to be on the advisory board for base paws, because, you know, we know that in humans, several different areas on the genome that primarily have to do with fat and carbohydrate metabolism, when people have duplicate copies of these areas, they tend to have more obesity. So we know there's a, a, a causality with certain areas on the genome and obesity in humans. We also have identified a couple of really interesting clusters in dogs that um, right now the focus has been on something called food drive. So why do these labs, for example, go crazy, you know, when you have a, a treat or whatever, back to the treat thing. But really that's because we have selected those dogs for training, which means food drive actually gets the objective we want, uh, getting back to the whole, you know, treat versus training type of, of ordeal. Um, because those labs, many of them, you know, we've just got extra large labs in this country because people are just giving them treats all the time. Because everything in this country is extra large. <laughs> <laughs> but getting back to, there, there's a genetic, and there are a couple of areas that we can't get into today, but, you know, certainly this is an active area of interest within base paws. This is one of the reasons why I think I'm, I'm on the advisory board because, you know, we, we, we are looking into that. Uh, I can tell you, you know, yes, I, I absolutely am convinced that there is this one particular area. And, you know, right now, this is why we need people like you, because the more cat genetic, genetic genomes, genetic uh, data that we obtain, the more we're able to understand. And, and I think that, you know, when 
I, I know that when um, Anya and I talk, uh, who's the CEO of, um, of Baseballs, you know, this is the big thing is when we reach that critical mass of data, that's when we can really make the intelligent assessments. This is what's happening with 23andMe. Guys, they did something spectacular at the beginning of COVID-19. They had, you know, tens of thousands of people, including my family, uh, and they were able to identify certain areas on the genome that said, wow, this person might be at more risk for complications from COVID-19. Or even with ACE2 receptors, they might even be more vulnerable or prone to it. So, you know, that's the beauty of this kind of data set. So again, yes, Becky, genetics have a play. But at the end of the day, too, you know, genetics don't determine your fate. And I think that's really important because one, one of the things that I worry about when we say, oh, you've got the gene for whatever, people throw their arms up in, in the air. Well, we know from exhaustive studies in humans and lab animals that your genes are about 30% of your eventual you know, fate or outcome. So you've got a large percentage of your fate, so to speak, in your hands. And in this case, in the food bowl of your cat. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great point. You know, avoid labels, putting things yeah. in boxes, so to say. So now let's address a couple of these questions that talk about multi-cat households. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to I'm going to say one of them. One of them mentions the free feeding of the dry kibble. So I'm going to let you address that. And the other is just sort of again, that's that, you know, we've got one f either a food garter or, you know, what does that look like in your multi-cat households? You've got a whole spiel, I know, because it's a struggle. Yeah, yeah. And this is why, you know, back in the day, I started calling those the food bowl bullies, because I would see these households of four or five cats, and there'd be one cat with tremendous obesity, and the other cats are like, fine. And and then it was funny to, to watch the owners when we would do our nutritional questionnaires, because they would say, these other cats can control themselves. These other cats don't overeat like this one cat. These other cats just pick a little bit at a time, you know, while he's, and it's like, guys, there's a behavior problem here. There's an intimidation threat going on, you know, and, and this cat is resource guarding is the terminology we might use, uh, you know, in, in, in the veterinary um, um, behavior circles. So resource garden, re, you know, this is a real issue. And so if you do have a multi-cat household and one of your cats has a weight problem, and the others seem to be svelte, do not think it's because those cat, cats have great self-control and willpower. <laughs> It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with fear for their life, right? They're like, oh my gosh, every time I go near the food bowl, he comes or she comes and pounces on me. Um, and this is why, you know, over the years, I've really gotten adamant uh, and ardent about my recommendations of isolate single food, food, food bowls. So, so individual feeding and timed feeding. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of one of those, those things where when people at first, if you've never done it before, you know, you're like, there's no way I could do it. It's sort of like you may a marathon. You're like, yeah, there's no way I could do a marathon. Uh, if you've never even done a 5k, I totally get that. But then once you've done a marathon, you're like, well, you know, I could never do an Ironman. And then once you do an Ironman, you're like, man, that marathon was easy. Right. I mean, so there are all these different levels in life. And so when people, when I say you should be feeding your cats individually, separated by 18 inches, give them 15 or so minutes to eat, you know, small portion, you know, in the morning, small portion in the evening, or, or however we want to break it up. You know, you can, there's some really interesting data to feed them once a day, but that's another day, another story, because I don't think we're, we can make any conclusions just yet. Um, but when, when you say that and people reject it, you know, they're like, no way. But what I found is when they, when I've had, you know, my pet parents and my patients, when they actually do it, you know, it's like three months later, Becky, they're just like, oh yeah, that was easy. You know, wait, wait, you mean you didn't have like this mutiny on your hands? Well, I mean like the first couple of weeks, they didn't seem to like it a whole lot, but then everybody got used to it and I don't even think about it anymore. That's yeah. really the, the reality of it. So individualized, isolated feedings separated by 18 inches, time it, you know, and this works out great. I mean, in pre-COVID when we were all getting ready for work, you know, even with my multi-cat household back in the day, when the kids trying to get the kids ready and get ready for work and get workouts in and all that stuff, you know, it was really convenient as well because we just, you know, put, put the food bowl down and cats and dogs, everybody came around and ate, you know, heck the kids were eating, you know, everybody just ate. And when, when everybody was done, we were getting ready to go to work and school, just pull up the bowls and, and go about it. I, I do think Becky, that the harm of the all day buffet is real. So the people that have these big, massive bowls and they just say, well, my cat will eat when it wants to, or whatever you're really encouraging and incentivizing and, and allowing a really unhealthy behavior. You know, I, I used to try to, to liken it with human analogy. I was like, so imagine you have a three-year-old child. Would you just leave a bowl of chocolate out all the time and say, hey, 
Tony, if you ever get hungry, there's a bowl of chocolate in there. Have at it. You can have as much as you want. In fact, if it gets halfway full, I'll top it off for you. So you don't even have to know how much you're eating. I mean, nobody would do that, right? But yet that's exactly the strategy that we employ with many of our cat households. You know, I think about it and I'm like, you wouldn't even allow them to have a healthy snack at an unlimited amount, right? You wouldn't even let them dive into all the apples and bananas that they wanted because too much of a good thing is even even a problem. So that makes so much sense, even if it is a reduced calorie diet, even if it's a weight loss diet, all day access is just not the answer. Okay, so then what about, this is a great question that I is is kind of a break off of that. Two cat household, one needs to lose weight, one needs to gain weight. I know you're saying it all comes down to calories count. How do you handle that? Yeah, well, this is again getting back to isolation or you know individualized isolated feeding. I, I think that's just this the solution for all of this. I mean, you know, and look, there are technological solutions that are slowly coming online. I mean, there are a couple of products out there that I think are getting super close, you know, and hopefully within the next year or two, we'll have a great technological solution where you know your cat right now they they wear RFID collars, you know, where it actually detects which cat is there and it can dispense certain foods and all that stuff. But you know. We're not quite there yet. We're getting super, super close. And I'm very, very optimistic. But again, just just pour the amount of calories that they should be fed and say, you know, hey, here's 10 or 15 minutes. As I mentioned before, you are sort of going getting, you know, somebody off of a, of a substance dependency. So there's not I mean, this isn't going to be easy at first. There are going to be behavior changes. You are going to be frustrated. You're going to be even, you know, many of my yeah, I, I'll tell you, this is where the support network, Becky, comes in because, you know, people are, are anxious about it. They go, oh, my gosh, and my cat's just like going back to back and forth to the to the food bowl, to the area that we feed them over and over and over again. They seem like they're they're just wanting this so much. I feel like I'm starving my cat. And this is where you have to have that support network. Uh, and honestly, if you're trying, you know, these same principles apply to human weight loss. I mean, I'm also a certified personal trainer. I'm an Ironman, you know, accredited coach. So what happens is, you know, you sometimes just need somebody there to hold your hand or tell you it's going to be okay. I mean, I can have an athlete who says, man, I, I, there's no way I'm going to get through this, this race or this workout, or there's no way I'm going to be able to meet this training load. Right. And sometimes you just need to, to have somebody else to bounce off and go, I think you can, let's figure out a solution to it. And so support yeah. is so important. This is why I'm a huge fan of what you do, Becky, because you are that guiding hand, that presence that can help allay some of those fears and concerns. I love doing it because uh, honestly, there's so many little tweaks and changes and just support that folks need to get through that. Another great recommendation is also just take a two week vacation and hire a pet sitter <laughs> and you just leave them with the new feeding instructions, tell them everything will be fine. And you come back in two weeks, you'll have a new pet. Oh, no. But Becky, but it, but in all seriousness, this, this is the lead bullet approach, right? People want the silver bullet. It doesn't exist. Yes. You mentioned that there are several little tiny tweaks. That's why the 90 day recheck, the 90 day reassessment and adjustments are so important. It's the lead bullets, but it's the, the relentless machine gunning of these lead bullets. You just don't stop until you reach the, the final objective. In this case, you know, an ideal healthy weight. And the reason this is important is because your cat's life literally depends on it. If you've got a 14, 15, 16 pound cat or even worse off, it's really not a matter of if they're going to get type 2 diabetes or diabetes in cats. It's just when, because they, they're physiologically not able to handle that amount of excess, excess fat tissue. It is damaging the pancreas. It is damaging all the, the, the these insulin receptors. I mean, it is causing chronic systemic inflammation. So, so it's unavoidable, Becky. That's the part that breaks my heart because, right. you know, I have that, that, crystal ball of experience. And so the, the person comes in with an 18 pound cat and they're shaking it off. They're nonchalant about it. They're like, ah, you know, he's happy. I mean, look at her, you know, she just lays around. I'm, and what I see in my crystal ball is I see one of two things, right? I see a, a diabetic who you can no longer control after six months. Right. And you just throw up your hands, you go, doc, it's time. And we're like, oh, yeah, right. I mean, so yeah. we, we all know that the ultimate treatment of diabetes in cats is euthanasia. I mean, I'll just be blunt and raw about it. But very few people are able to manage diabetic cat for years and years and years. Becky, I mean, think about it, right? We've been doing this a long time. A you can yeah. count on a hand, right? The number of, of cats that are, yeah, we've been managing him for the past six, seven years with diabetes. It's like, what? <laughs> wow, that's an outlier. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, 
you know, or they wind up having a stroke, you know, or they wind up having crippling arthritis. They wind up having high blood pressure that blows out their kidneys. They, they go into kidney failure, which is one of the consequences of, of, of obesity. So, you know, that's the crystal ball part that, that, that does break my heart. And when people say, as you started the whole conversation off, why are you passionate about it? Number one, you know, I want them to live longer, but most importantly, I want them to have a high quality of life. I don't want them to suffer and have this catastrophic end. Yeah. It's like when I talk about tick-borne illness and I say, you guys, this is lifelong preventable disease. The idea, anytime as a veterinary professional that you're faced with a preventable disease, a vaccinatable condition, uh, you know, anything that's preventable and it's ultimately, especially, you know, either um, life ending or highly life altering, it is really a heartbreaking situation because it's already too late. Um, the disease is there, the osteoarthritis is there. And, um, you know, we, our, our cats hide it better than anyone. So our dogs are going to limp and be sore and get up slow. Our cats just hide that so much. And, you know, um, you've even also lectured about the links to obese, um, from obesity to cancer. Yeah. So, I mean, we're really talking about some serious conditions that will cost your cat their life. Oh yeah, it, it's quite quite frightening because you know. So pe people historically, we have said spay your your female cat or your male uh, so that they don't get all these reproductive organ cancers like breast cancer in females. Well, yeah. guess what? If they have obesity, their risk of developing breast cancer is now back up at the normal level. So it's like, wow, that spaying really didn't have the protective you know feature that we we had hoped it would, especially when you have like a twenty two pound cat. So you know, it, it is it is quite frightening the number of cancers that are related to it and, and just all the underlying, you know, it's the quality of life, Becky, that really ultimately is what, what drives me because, you know, these cats that are 18 pounds, they feel lousy, you know, I mean, and then they maybe even have this sort of weird food addiction, however we want to describe yeah. that, you know, they've got, they have mood swings, tremendous, you know, anxieties. I mean, there's a lot going on there. And I did notice one question about the link between like stress and overeating and you're oh, yeah. absolutely right. I mean, stress does lead to overeating. You know, this is the classic cortisol response. And I think that when we don't provide an, an, an enriched environment, if we don't, you know, this is where play comes in. So, you know, feather duster, laser pointer, remote control, whatever it is, but your, your cat craves those kind of interactions. I mean, you know, the, the little hunter feeders, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do to enrich their environment. But when your cat is devoid of that, there you go. There's Dr. Liz's stuff. Uh, but when we when we don't give them those environmental enrichment, then they stress, they get stressed out, you know, because I, this is a, an apex predator. I mean, this is a, this is a, a species that is used to being out in the wild and being able to, to, to provide for itself. You know, dogs are scavengers. They're opportunistic scavengers. So they just kind of like, hey, I found something. Mm, okay, it's rotten. Oh, yeah, we right. know that. <laughs> Whereas a cat is a lot more selective in their prey. They stalk and pounce and jump. You know, they do all the, the amazing things that they do. Uh, but but again, that stress anxiety does lead to overeating. And then the problem is when they start that overeating cycle, this is where the neurochemical, the brain changes begin. And now you've got a real problem. Sure. And no different than people. Stress is a cortisol response. Cortisol is a, a steroid. Steroids make you hungry. Like you have this whole endocrine response. It's, your brain is telling you you are hungry and you should go eat. I mean, they cannot even help it. That's the hard part too, right? With cats and the, and they don't have coping mechanisms like people like, okay, we'll go take a walk or I'll go find a toy to play with. They go to what their physiological messages are telling them. So um, one last question for you before I let you go, because I could keep you here all day. Uh, but how often should we be weighing our pets? I understand the 90 day follow up, but when we're outside of that veterinary follow up, we're got to the ideal weight or we're monitoring great at home. What does that look like? How often should we be checking in? Yeah, great question. So now let's talk about a cat with obesity. So this is going to be a cat that's 13, 14 pounds or over. Uh, you definitely during the first 90 days, the first three months, I want to weigh them every month because I want to see is anything working? You know, if, is, if we're not moving the needle and quite frankly, I will, I will change stuff in the first two months, right? I don't wait for 90 days. If the cat comes in a month later and they gained a half a pound, we're going to, we're going to get more aggressive. So the first 90 days, I typically recommend reweighing monthly, but after the 90 days, I tip, I recommend and uh, generally for cats every three months weighing at the vet clinic. Now, I know some veterinarians will definitely want to weigh them more frequently. If I've got a 22 pound, a 26 pound cat, I'm going to want to see it more frequently. But in general terms, I, I start to cut down to 90 days. This doesn't mean that we don't weigh. 
what I t try to get people to do because with cats, it's pretty easy is I want them to weigh them at home. You know, so weigh yourself, then pick up your cat, weigh yourself again, take the difference. And that's your cat's weight. And, you know, sometimes my vet colleagues will say, oh, but that's not an accurate weight. I'm not interested in accuracy or precision with that. I'm actually looking at a trend because then when you, my veterinary technician, Becky, follow up with a phone call or email, say, hey, what was, uh, you know, uh, Bosco's uh, last weight? Then you tell me whatever it is you've got. And if we compare two data points, Becky, it's either up or or is either up same or down. And, you know, so now I've got a trend line. And so if it goes up, you know, that's the time to say, Hey, well, you know, we may want to go ahead and get you in a little sooner for that recheck. I know we're not scheduled for another month, but you know, I think Dr. Ward's going to want to see you because, you know, obviously the weight may be headed in the wrong direction and there may be something we can do. So right. weighing at home is not that hard. I, I really, I don't know why more, I don't know why more, more vets don't recommend it and why more pet parents don't just do it. Yeah. I'm always, people will regularly say, I don't have, I don't know how to weigh my pet. And you know, when you say just pick them up, it's like, Ooh, so I love that you mentioned that. Cause it's really so important. Becky, Becky, I, I just, uh, yeah, apparently people are, are trying to train their dogs to sit on scales. And, um, while that's great and everything, it's a whole lot easier for me just to pick them up. Now, granted, if you have a physical limitation or if you have a very large dog, that's not, a, a, that's a great approach, right? But I don't think a great Dane is going to fit on my little bathroom scales. Having said that, you know, again, I don't want the, I don't want people ever saying, well, the reason I can't weigh my dog is because it won't sit still on the scale. <laughs> like, yeah. But it is a cool trick to teach your, teach your cat to sit on the scale. That would be very cool to teach your cat to sit on a scale. If anybody I tell my has clients done, to do it all the time. Yeah. So I want to see a video of that and I will share that far and wide and sing your praises. <laughs> Mystic the Bengal. Oh my gosh. Check him out. He's, he does it all the time. But yeah, I do because target training and, and because when we're for the exact reason, when we are monitoring weight, it is the easiest thing to do. Um, there's so many great tips and tricks in here, Dr. Ernie. Uh, where, where can we find more info? Where should folks be going? Tell them about the survey. What do we got? Yeah. Please go to petobesityprevention.org and sign up for our surveys. Um, this year, our, our vet clinic survey is going to be postponed till spring due to COVID, obvious reason. Uh, but uh, we want you as pet parents, cat parents, to sign up because we send out surveys once a year to ask your opinions on pet obesity, pet weight loss, diet, nutrition, supplements, the whole thing. It's a short little survey, but this is so impactful for the organization organization. Uh, I think that website, you know, we've, we try to give some just good basic tools. There's calorie calculators. My favorite tool on the website, there was something that's now almost, it's almost 20 years old now, I think. Um, but it's called the human to pet weight translator. And let me just put it in perspective. If you have a 50, if I had a 15 pound cat today in front of me, and then I said, okay, what would that be in my weight? Right? So like, I think sometimes we don't understand what 15 pounds to this domestic short haired cat is. Well, if you take a 15 pound domestic short haired cat and you apply that and say, okay, Ernie, we're going to make you correspondingly the same amount of weight. I weigh 140 pounds, Becky. I'm five foot eight. So my BMI is a 22. So I'm right in the middle where I need to be. But if I were a 15 pound cat, I would weigh 254 pounds. Now think about that. That's 114 pounds more on this little frame, right? That's like my six foot three marine husband. Exactly. Yeah, that's so, scary. So I, I think I, I really like the human to pet weight translator because it gives you a unique perspective on where your cat or your dog really is. And, yes. and it's it's really, it's, it's quite accurate. You can see there's different charts and you can get some ideas. And But uh, you know, that's one of the, the tools that, that um, I think more people need to see and use and at least understand because it does change the entire perspective on, you know, Hey, well, my, I only have a 90 pound lab. Well, if your 90 pound lab were me, uh, that would be like me weighing 220 pounds. What? Yeah. I was thinking about that when you were talking about weight loss, I was thinking about the percentage, like one pound a year, that's really like 10% of their body weight, which like, if you were gaining 10% of your body weight every year, your doctors would be like, pumping your brakes. What's going on with you? I mean, that 10% is increases actually a lot. Yeah, and, and so when it comes to people, cats, that's 10 individual pieces of food. And then that's nothing, right? Cause like I'm, you know, I've seen my husband pour that in there, you know, throw in a couple of treats around just because they're being cute and they're playful. We can so, and we, we inadvertently do it with ourselves, right? We understand why it can happen, how it can happen, especially in households with multiple people. You're throwing a kitty treat down. Your kids are throwing kitty treats down. And before we know it, Kitty's 
got the treats. Um, <laughs> you're changing the world, Dr. Ernie. You know, you really are um, because you're you're giving us more time with our pets and you are bringing a new awareness to how we talk about it and actually talking about it. Not calling it like fluffy wuffy or a little poofy woofy. You know, it's a serious condition. It's an obesity disease and we really need to um, flip the narrative and really take a physiologically uh, realistic approach to talking about this with our clients, with our pet parents. And thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you, Becky. I'm a huge fan of yours. As you know, I have so much respect for you guys. It is national veterinary technician week. Becky is one of the best and brightest. So please send her some love. And if there's a vet tech in your life, definitely shower them with praise this week because Lord knows they don't get enough of it. So I just wanted to give that quick little plug. You are the best. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Dr. Ernie. I am so happy you could be here with us. Uh, Dr. Ernie Ward, you can find him on all the social media things, even on Twitter. I hear we have a podcast together. We've done this now for 200 episodes, creeping up on four years. Um, and anywhere else they can find you, Dr. Ernie, where should they be checking? No, I definitely head over to Instagram, Facebook. Uh, Instagram is where I guess I'm a little more active these days at Dr. Ernie Ward, but I'm at Dr. Ernie Ward everywhere. I really appreciate a follow or a subscribe or whatever it is that you do these days. Just push the heart, tap things twice, <laughs> head over to petobesityprevention.org and make sure you are filling out those surveys. It's how we know how you're doing, how we know how we better serve you and how we check in with Cats of America. I know I have all the best cat owners in the world here watching right now. So make sure you guys are keeping up to date. Dr. Ernie, thank you so much. We'll see you real soon. I know we don't ever let you get too far. Thank you. Thanks so much.